Again, it is a blessing to have the music back, that is for sure. Amen. Amen to that. So, as you know, Lisa and I just sold our house back in Pennsylvania about a month ago, right? So, if you ever sold your house, you know what all that goes into that, right? You got the appraisals, the showings, you have the offers, and then you have enough paperwork to give you carpal tunnel. But on the other hand, if you ever built your house from the ground up, and I know Marla, you know all about building things from the ground up, you know what kind of planning and preparation that takes. And the first thing you have to do is what? You gotta count the cost, right? You gotta see, do I have the money, do I have the land to build the property on? And then the second thing you have to do is to lay the foundation, right? And we always lay the foundation from the bottom up, right? So you never put the roof on first and then start to build your way down. So what I want to do in the next few weeks here at First Baptist Howard is to build the foundation. And I would actually say let's reinforce the foundation because I perceive that there's a foundation here already laid. And I praise God for men and women who came before me to lay that foundation so as we begin sort of a new chapter and a new year, I just want to reinforce our foundation to see who we are and what we want to build on. And how are we going to do this? i tell you how we're not going to do it. We're not going to look at 10 tips to how to grow your church. We're going to look directly into the Word of God Amen. and pull out some foundational principles to build the church upon and a lot of times I think, you know, a lot of Christians, oh, this is, this is old school stuff. But a lot of times we have to review these things because we can easily get astray and we can start to do our own thing. And the first foundational truth comes from Psalm 127. And before we read that psalm, I want to tell you a little context about the psalm. It's grouped in a, a group of psalms from Psalm 120 to Psalm 134. And those psalms were called the Psalms of Ascent. And if you remember last week, we talked about those three feasts. Remember those three Old Testament feasts? When the people were going up to Jerusalem for those feasts, they would sing these psalms. They were the Psalms of Ascent. And they were very similar to our Christmas carols or our patriotic songs. They invoked deep emotion and shared values. So... I'm going to read just the first verse, and I want us then to read it together as a church. So if you'd stand to honor the Lord, and we're going to read Psalm 127, verse 1. I'll read it, and then we can read it together as a church. Psalm 127, verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, the labor, they labor in vain to build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Let's read it together. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchmen stay awake in vain. Thank you, guys. So, we just read this, this one verse, but there's a lot in this one verse. And the first, one of the first words we come upon is the word house. And yes, it could mean a building, it could mean a structure, but it could also mean the people with inside, who are inside the structure. So you could translate this verse in a few different ways, okay? You could say, unless the Lord builds the church, the congregation labors in vain. You could say, unless the Lord builds the marriage, the couple labor in vain. You could say, unless the Lord builds the family, the parents labor in vain. So many people say, oh, such and such is failing, and you have to ask yourself, well, who's building it? Are you building it, or is the Lord Jesus Christ building, building it? So I think we all here would agree that Psalm 127, verse 1, we say yes and amen to that, right? But how does it all work? And I just think there's a few principles that we can take from this. And the first principle, the first truth is, number one, the Lord Jesus bought the house, okay? The Lord Jesus bought the house. 
Isn't that what we said? If you're going to build on anything, you first have to purchase the property. And the Bible tells us that Jesus has bought us, not with silver or gold, but with the precious blood of the Lamb. Paul, in Acts chapter 20, he gave some of his final words to the Ephesian elders in Miletus. And he said this to them, his parting words. He says, take heed to yourself and to the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Jesus purchased the church with his own blood. Therefore, Jesus has absolute and complete authority over the church. Colossians 1.18 says, He is the head of the body, the church. And what's the head? Think about the head as far as your physical being. The head is the command center. It's where everything else flows from. Your breathing, your heart rate, the way your fingers move, the way your toes move. It's all controlled from the brain, from the head. Jesus is the head of the church. The, the church doesn't belong to me. The church doesn't belong to the deacons. The church doesn't belong to the trustees. The church doesn't belong to the town of Howard. The church belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot forget this basic foundational principle that Jesus Christ has bought the church with his own blood. And if we're thinking about like a work site, Jesus would be the foreman on the work site calling the shots. And we're simply managers of what Jesus has given to us, okay? So the first thing is, Jesus bought the church with his blood. But how's, how's that worked out in church history? How has the headship of Jesus Christ worked out in church history? If we look at the church history, just a small preview, we look in the book of Acts. And the church started off pretty good. Obviously not perfect, but the they, Bible tells us they were of one accord. They were filled with the Spirit, and they met each other's needs. A pretty healthy church. Look, they gave themselves to four things. Four things. Okay? Acts chapter 2. The apostles' teaching, which is the Word of God. Fellowship, getting together with brothers and sisters. The breaking of the bread, which we did last week. And prayer. Apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of the bread, and prayer. Four basic things they did. They didn't have all this technology. They didn't have all these things. They did four things. And what happened? It says, the Bible says they turned the world upside down. Okay? Four things. Let's fast forward. The third century, a man named Constantine, he comes on the scene, right? He makes Christianity the formal state religion. And guess what took priority? Instead of those four things, they were removed politics, power, money, and control. Those are the things that took place. And what happened? Well, we started separating people. We said, all oh, the clergy's up here, and we have all these ranks of clergy, and all these people with these flowy robes on, and the lay people are over here. Okay? And let me tell you, pastors and leaders are no different than anybody else. We are all sinners saved by the grace of God. There's no hierarchy system, okay? But what else happened? Well, the Word of God became shrouded in darkness, okay? It was in a language that most people could not read nor understand. And thus you have what we call the Dark Ages. The Word of God was shrouded, and politics and power took front and center stage. It was a dark time for the church. But then we go forward to the 14th century and the 15th century. The Reformation, guys like uh, Calvin and Luther and Zwingli, and we have the invention of what? The Gutenberg Press, and we started printing Bibles at a profound pace, and everyone could have their own copy of the Bible, and there was a great return to the Word of God and the fundamental principles found in the Word of God. And I want to make note, every revival, if you study revivals, whether it's in the Bible, like Ezra and Nehemiah, or, you know, Josiah, if you look at revivals, and even in the modern times, it always starts. It always, always, always starts with a return to the Word of God. It always starts there. So what about today? 2021. Can you believe we're saying 2021? 
We have access to so much at our fingertips. You can listen to theology, sermons, Bible. you can have Bibles in any language, Hebrew, Greek, right here at your fingertips. But what's happening? What's going on? The church is, is falling away, so to speak, right? We see a church that is weak. We see a church that is anemic. Why? We have everything that we could ever want. Well, I, I believe, personally, we want to be culturally accepted. We want to fit in, so we're getting away from the foundational principles found in the Word of God and going to a socially accepted gospel. But remember what Jesus said. He said, look, if they hated me, if they put me on a cross, what do you think they're going to do to you? But listen, he said, great is your reward when people persecute you. And friends, I'm not an alarmist, but I believe persecution is coming. But remember, Jesus said, blessed are you when you are persecuted. So we cannot forget this truth that Jesus bought us with his blood. We belong to him. But the second principle is, not only has Jesus bought the house, Jesus built the house. And he does it, I believe, in three specific ways. He does it through the Holy Spirit. He does it through the Word of God. And he does it through the works of the saints. He first does it through the Holy Spirit. Look, if the Holy Spirit isn't operating, if we aren't submitting to the will of the Holy Spirit, we're, we are nothing more than a social club. We're just getting together, singing some songs, hanging out, and that's it. If we don't have the Holy Spirit moving in our lives, because the Holy Spirit, He has such an important role to play. Okay? The main role of the Holy Spirit is John chapter 16, verse 14. He makes known to us the things of Christ. So what does he do? He takes up the things of Christ and he reveals them to you and I. And then he also, John chapter 16, guides us into all truth. How do you know truth? Through the Holy Spirit. How do you remember truth? By the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is necessary in building of the church. And also the Holy Spirit has gifted us, each one of us, with gifts. For what purpose? Why did he give you a gift? Is it just for you? No. Paul tells us specifically why these gifts were given to the church. Ephesians 4.12, it says, to prepare God's people for the work of the ministry so that the body, that's us, may be built up. The gifts are to build the body of Christ up. You say, how does, the, how does church growth happen? Well, it happens by the apostles' teaching, breaking of the bread, fellowship, prayer, and the Holy Spirit working in the lives of the children of God. That's how church growth happens, right? A lot of people say, well, isn't it about numbers, you know? How many people do you, that's usually what pastors say, you know, you meet a pastor for the first time, how many people do you have come to your church? Right? That's, that's the question they usually ask. And you say, oh, 25, 30. It's not about how many people come to your church. Because think about it. Yes, you want people to come to your church. You want people, but you want the people to come to Jesus. But you can be two miles wide and only two inches deep. So, you know, it's, it's all about not just having the numbers, but strength within the church. Because... Again, and that only comes through the Holy Spirit. Because remember, what's the Holy Spirit? Who is the Holy Spirit? He's the one who convicts people of sin. He's the one who draws people to Jesus Christ. So without the Holy Spirit, the church won't grow. Paul made it really simple. He said, we plant, we water, and God makes the church grow. Right? That's what the book of Acts says. He says, it says, God added to the church daily such as should be saved. Our job is to plant. Our job is to water. Okay? And the church of Galatia, the book of Galatians, they forgot this simple fact. And Paul gives them a sharp rebuke in Galatians chapter 3, verse 3. He says, You foolish Galatians, after beginning in the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? He said, Look, you guys started off so good. You started off Walking in the Spirit, you were meeting each other's needs, you were relying on me, and then something happened. 
You started relying on your own strength. He said, don't be so foolish, Galatians. We have to rely on the Holy Spirit. It's not about how cool our church looks. It's not about how fancy our sound system is. It's about the Holy Spirit moving on the hearts of men and women that makes the church grow. Okay? He builds his church through the Holy Spirit, but he also builds the church through the Word of God. Now, when we say the word church, the word church is only used one time in all four Gospels, and it's found in Matthew 16, verse 16. Matthew 16, verse 16. Peter, good old Peter, he makes this great confession about Jesus Christ. He says, Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, you're correct, Peter. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who, who is in heaven, and upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. Upon what rock? Upon the rock, the truth that Jesus is the Son of the living God. That's what he's going to build the church upon. That's our cornerstone. We have to have the Word of God if the church is ever going to be built up. And the cool thing about the Lord, he tells us exactly how to do it. Listen to this, this, this strange verse in Isaiah 28, verse 10. Isaiah 28, verse 10. Precept must be upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. Precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. If we're ever going to grow as a church, we have to have a steady diet of the Word of God. Not funny stories, not little cute jokes, but we need the Word of God. And that's why in a couple weeks after we get through this, we are going to start the book of Colossians. And guess what we're going to do? We're going to go line upon line, precept upon precept, truth upon truth. And I pray you'll have a better understanding of who Christ is and that your roots will start to grow deeper than ever before. The Bible says God's word is like a hammer in Jeremiah. We all know about hammers. We used some hammers a couple days ago. They can tear things down, right? But what, if you're ever going to build anything, what? You need a hammer to fasten things up. So we have to have the word of God to fasten one truth upon another truth upon another truth. And personal testimony, my roots never really started growing deep. And my Christian walk never really had any growth until... We went through the book of Romans. The book of Romans, my eyes were just like opened up. And guess what we did? One, one line at a time. It wasn't anything eloquent. It was just simply teaching the Bible. And I'll tell you what, my roots at that point started to grow down into the Word of God. A lot of division and the conflict in the church today could be resolved by people knowing the Word of God. Usually when division occurs... It's somebody being ignorant of the scriptures and walking in the flesh. So Christ uses the Holy Spirit to build a church. He uses the Word of God to build a church. And last but not least, we're not going to get off that easy, guys. He uses the works of the saints to build the church. Okay? Dude, I wish it was that easy, right? We're just going to read the Bible. We're just going to pray. And everything's just going to just happen. But no, He uses us, right? And he says it's work, the work of ministry. That's what we read in Psalm 127, right? He says labor. That word labor is what you guys pretty much do every single day of your lives. Toilsome, heavy labor. It's sweaty, it's dirty, it's uncomfortable. At times it can be painful. It's spiritually draining, it's mentally draining, and it can be physically draining. It's laborsome. And sometimes it takes a sacrifice. Sometimes it takes a sacrifice of your time. It takes a sacrifice of your energy. Sometimes it takes getting a little bit uncomfortable. Maybe sometimes it takes some practice. But look, Paul talks about this idea in Romans chapter 12. He's, he says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. I mean, I've read that, I don't know how many times I've read that. But I was contemplating that a couple weeks ago. Think about that. A living sacrifice. Usually sacrifices are dead, right? But think about the picture there. 
Think, just meditate upon that. You have the brazen altar, you have the four horns coming up, and you have the sacrifice going on to this, this hot grate. Think about that. A living sacrifice can be a little bit uncomfortable. A living sacrifice can be a little inconvenient. A living sacrifice can be at times even a little excruciating. But I'll tell you, there's no greater joy than serving the Lord and becoming a living sacrifice and serving one another and blessing up one another with the gifts the Lord has given to you. The Bible tells us it's like, it's like a savor of rest going up to the Lord when we present our bodies as living sacrifices. So it's like this. It's each and every day. Lord, I wake up. I present to you my mind, Lord. Give me those clean thoughts. Give me pure thoughts, Lord. Lord, I give you my eyes, Lord. Let my eyes not look on anything profane today. Lord, I present to you my hands. Let the work that my hands do, let it be pleasing to you. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my everything. Lord, may my feet be ready to take the gospel anywhere that you take me, Lord. That's presenting yourself as a living sacrifice. And as I said, he's given us each a gift. And I believe it's more than one gift. I always say the spiritual gifts are like a pallet of paint. How many of you guys remember Bob Ross? Bob Ross fans. Anybody? Big brother? Yeah, right? Is he amazing? He's amazing. But I remember back in the day watching this guy. He had his palette, right? Big old palette with the gobs of paint. But by the end of that show, all that paint would be blended, right? It wouldn't stay just green or red or white. And I think that's what the spiritual gifts are like. Like, you might not just all be green. Like, you might have predominantly green, but there might be a little white, a little bit of red in there. So, a lot of people, this is what they say, that's not my gift. And you got, I ask, you ever try painting, painting in that color? It might come out really beautiful. You just never know. That's why sometimes you have to just step out and say, hey, I don't know if this is my gift, but I'm going to give it a shot. A healthy, growing church is a church where the body of Christ, or each, each and every one of us, are using our spiritual gifts to build one another up. And you say, well, what's my spiritual gift? And if you go online, you can find all these little tests. I mean, some of them are extensive. But I try to keep things as simple as possible. Ask yourself three questions. What's your spiritual gift? Okay? What are you passionate about? Where do you find yourself most of the time? And what does the Lord keep bringing to your attention? Those three. What are you passionate about? Where do you find yourself most of the time? And what does the Lord keep bringing up to your attention? That's probably your spiritual gift. And there's four lists. There's four lists of gifts and manifestations. If you're interested, it's Romans 12. 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians chapter 4, and 1 Peter chapter 4. And before anybody comes up to me and asks me after service, yes, I believe in the sign gifts. Yes, I do believe. I believe that God still heals people. I still believe He works miracles. Because I believe what the Bible says is that my God never changes. And He's the same yesterday, today, and He's forever. Because if he healed back in the day, back years ago, just because we have the Bible, I don't believe he stopped healing people. I believe God still works miracles today. But that's off the point. But the fact is, the question we have to ask ourselves is, are we using our gifts to build up the body of Christ? And may I say, not one gift is more important than the other. We need every gift operating. Paul, again, he uses the body a lot as an imagery. And he says, look, the eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. And the hand can't say to the foot, I don't need you. No. You know how it is when one part of your body hurts or gets something gets messed up, what happens? Usually your whole body just, ugh, doesn't feel good. And he's saying, look, just because some gifts aren't as visible you know, some gifts aren't up front, so to speak. It doesn't mean they're not important. 
All the gifts are important. What happens, the bulletins, that's important. What happens behind the scenes, it's all important. We can't function without them. So each gift is equally important. So how does this all work? Let me give you a little quick, quick gesture on how this should work. Right? You have an evangelist say, I've got a new idea. The prayer warrior says, hey, I'm going to pray for that idea. And the, giver, the giver says, hey, what do you need to help fund that? And then the administrator says, hey, I'm going to help you organize that. And the server says, hey, let me, let me help you get things ready. And then the evangelist goes out and advertises and gets people to come in. And then the teachers share devotion and the word of God. Now, that is really oversimplified. But basically, that's how things should look. Because look, unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers will labor in vain. And I don't know about you, you don't want to labor in vain, right? There's nothing worse than putting in a hard day's work and absolutely seeing no results. So unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers will labor in vain. And he builds it through the work of the Holy Spirit, he builds it through the Word of God, and He builds it through the works of the saints. And I pray that we here at First Baptist of Howard, that we would be found faithful with what the Lord has entrusted to each and, one, each and every one of us, as well as a congregation. Amen? Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank You, Lord, that it, it's not really up to us. Um, you just invited us into this awesome relationship where you saved us, you called us, and now you invite us into the work of the ministry. We know that you are absolutely able to do this without us. But what a privilege it is to be able to come alongside and to serve our King, to serve our Savior, to serve our Lord in this way. And Father, I just pray for our church here. I pray for each and every one of us. Lord, that we would really seek out the gifts that you gave to us. Lord, that maybe some would just step out in faith and try some new things. Maybe that you keep bringing to their attention. That this would be a year where they say, yes, I found a new gift the Lord has given to me. And I'm using it, not for myself, but to build another brother or sister or child up. So Father, we thank you for the gifts of the Spirit. We thank you for the Word of God, which is our solid rock. Lord, because without it, there's nothing to stand on. And we thank you, Lord, for the works of the saints, that you brought each and every one of us here to this place for a specific reason, for a specific time, with a specific purpose, Lord. We know you don't do anything half-heartedly. And we know each and every one of us, Lord, you have a plan for. It. So, Lord, may we seek your will in this next coming week. Lord, where you would have us, where you would want us to serve. Lord, that others could know the love of Jesus Christ. And that the church would grow, not only outwardly, but that we would grow down deep, Lord, with our roots rooted in Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for this time, and we thank you for your word, and we pray this in your name. Amen. For a closing hymn, let's turn to uh, hymn number 431, I Need Thee Every Hour. Please be standing. We're going to sing the first and last verse.
this, this service with that verse, it's better to trust in the Lord than to trust in men. And I pray that this week, our trust will be on the solid rock, which is Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you, keep you, and strengthen you for whatever challenges and opportunities that, that may present themselves this week.